one of the problems in the practice comes from the fact that we can read about the entire practice all the way from the very beginning steps up to the highest. And whether it's because we live in a culture that tries to boil everything down to the simplest steps or just basic human nature, impatience, we want to go straight to the top. So we get impatient with the beginning steps, especially when we see our minds muddling around with concentration. Mindfulness is hard. Actually, the simple act of mindfulness isn't that hard, but it's sticking with it, maintaining mindfulness, maintaining alertness, all these other qualities. Those are hard to do. And so we look for the quick insight. with a quick tactic that can take us straight to the top so we can get this meditation business behind us and get on with our lives. It doesn't work that way. You can't just let go totally in one moment and have the whole job done. It's like playing a game of chess. You can't have your queen just leap across the board and put the king on the other side in a checkmate. It takes many stages, many steps. Some of your chess pieces you have to do your best to protect. Others you have to be willing to sacrifice. And only as you maintain your strategy and develop your strategy do you finally get to the point where you win. Checkmate. And then you lose interest in the pieces. The game is done. That's when you let go of everything. But in the meantime, there's lots of things you've got to hold on to. A very simple principle that John Lee mentions is that first you learn how to let go of whatever is obviously bad, obviously unskillful, and hold on tight to what's skillful. And when your skillful qualities have done your work, then you can turn around and look at them. See how those are fabricated as well. Then you let them go. It all sounds nice and linear, but as you know, if you've been practicing any length of time, there are ups and downs, ins and outs. You make progress, then you backtrack, then you have to try another tack. But it's important that you don't see the backtracking as a total waste. It's simply a matter of there are more lessons that you have to learn more carefully figure out new ways of approaching. And all in the course of this, you develop your discernment, which is necessary. Nec discernment isn't just a matter of cloning what you read in the books. It's a more tactical kind of thing. For example, with the khandhas, the five clinging aggregates. We read in the, the Buddha's second sermon, not self-characteristic. As you contemplate these, then you let them go. And we tend to forget this was delivered to people who had already become stream enters, already had a good foundation in the practice. That's when they let go of everything. But in the meantime, you've got to take those khandhas and you convert them into the path. You look at the different elements in the path, or the different factors. Take right concentration, for example. There's directed thought and evaluation. That's fabrication. There's feelings of pleasure, that's feeling. There's the perception of whatever object you're focused on. As, as the Buddha said, all concentration states up through the dimension of nothingness. These are all perception attainments. In fact, they're based on a perception that you keep in mind, like you focus on just breath, breath, breath. Then there's the form of the body, and there's the awareness of all this. There, you've got the five aggregates right there. And you look at the other factors of the path, and you find that the aggregates are all involved there. So it's a matter of taking the aggregates that you've been carrying around. An analogy I've used many times before. You, you stop carrying them on your back, and you place them down, and 
Suppose there were a load of bricks you had on your back. Well, you take the bricks and you turn them into a path. They walk on them. That gets you where you want to go. One of the Buddha's insights into our experience of the aggregates is that each of them has an intentional element. There's the raw material for the experience of form or feeling, perception, etc. And then you have an intention that actually turns it into the actual experience of form, feeling, etc. Which means if you change your intentions, you change the way these things function. This is how you use them as the path. For instance, form. Even our experience of the body is not totally given. There's an element of past karma there, but that's also our present karma. The breath is the factor that fabricates your experience of your body. And there is an intentional element in how you breathe. So learn how to take advantage of that. Breathe in a way that's comfortable. Breathe in a way that you can stay focused on. And that simple act, if you use it for the purpose of training the mind, turns the form of your body or sensation of the body into an element of the path. So try to take advantage of this fact that the way you feel, the way you perceive things has an intentional element. And learn how to manipulate these things in a way that help develop the qualities you want. Mindfulness, alertness, concentration, discernment. So you can use these as the various pieces in your chess game. There may come a point in the game where you have to let go of something in order to advance. But before you have to let go of it, make sure you use it for what you can. Otherwise, you may have to lose your bishop at some point in the, in the game. But you use, use the bishop in the meantime to protect the pawns and the other pieces that need protecting as you advance. As John Lee used to say, you don't just throw everything away. You learn how to take good care of it. Because these are your tools. How, otherwise, how would you get to awakening? How would you get to nirvana? Nirvana, after all, is unconditioned. It's not something that can be manipulated. You can't use it as a path. You can't use nirvana as a path to get to nirvana. You have to use conditioned things. So you've got the breath here. Now, sometimes the breath can be a problem, but you learn how to focus on it, stay mindful, stay alert. And that will take you to deeper and deeper states of concentration. Being alert to when the breath is long, when it's short, to see how these different types of breathing feel. When it's deep, when it's shallow, how does that feel? You can experiment. And again, there's an intentional element in this, so take advantage of the fact to try things in different ways. See what works, see what doesn't work. And ultimately, you get to the point where the breath stops. It's not that there's no breath energy in the body. The body is actually filled with breath energy, but it's a very still kind of energy. It's like each little cell in the body just humming with breath. So you don't have to pull the breath in, you don't have to push it out. That's when you can start acquainting yourself with the other elements in the body as well. The fire element, which is the sense of warmth in the body. Where is that? What happens when you focus on that? Again, you bring an intentional element in to see if you can activate it. Where is the warmth strongest in the body? Focus there first and then think of spreading the warmth throughout the rest of the body. It's like turning up the thermostat. 
experimenting with a new stereo system. You've got to see how loud it can get. Well, of course, you turn it all the way up. It's way too loud. It's uncomfortable. So you tune it down again. Then you find what's just right. It's the same with the elements. They're paired. There's Fire is paired with water. Earth is paired with breath. Earth is a sense of solidity, heaviness. Breath is a sense of lightness and energy, movement. And since you've learned how to tune things back and forth this way, find what feels just right. At the porridge in the story of Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold. This has several advantages. One is you can learn there are times when you have certain imbalances in the body, and you can intentionally correct the balance. If you're feeling dizzy and lightheaded, think about earth. If you're feeling sluggish and depressed, think about breath. But even more importantly, when you get everything really balanced, then it's a lot easier to move from the sense of the shape of the body into space. This is where you've let go of the breath and you let go of form. You move into the area of the, the mental aggregates, feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness. Start out with space. Just think of the space that permeates the body. It goes between all the atoms throughout the body. It spreads out. It's unlimited. Because this kind of space can go through all atoms everywhere. and learn how to maintain that perception. When it's solid enough, then you can ask, okay, what is it that's aware of the space? And it's just the knowing, knowing, knowing that's there. Maintain that perception. Get good at that. And you let go of the oneness of that knowing. That moves you to the dimension of nothingness. Take this as far as you can go. The basic principle is that you solidify the state of concentration you're in, and then you notice where's the stress that's still in that state of concentration. It's like stepping back a minute. When you're in totally in that state of concentration, everything is really, really still. You can't think about anything. But then you can step back a bit and see okay, what's actually happening here. Notice where's the stress, where's the where the activities and intentions that lead to that stress, then you drop those intentions. This will either move you to a deeper state of concentration or take you out of concentrate well, take you beyond concentration entirely. So again, you're using the concentration to the point where you can let it go, where you can sacrifice it for something better, for, for a checkmate. But you can't start out saying, well, I'll just go straight to the top. I don't want to get attached to concentration, so I just won't do it. That leaves you at your baseline. Your chess pieces haven't moved at all, and yet you want to imagine chess checkmate. So you move your pawn here, move your pawn there, get the pieces out on the board. And feel your way into the practice. A lot of this comes from feeling your way. You can read the books and have everything planned out beforehand, and then you'll discover your practice doesn't quite go that way. Just like each game of chess is a little bit different. But you take the basic principles and you apply them, and you develop patience as best you can. And then you let go in stages. And John Fung's analogy was of a rocket going up to the moon, he said. There's the main rocket, and then that drops away, and it sends the nose cone, or the capsule, all the way to the moon. So each part does its work, and then you let it go to move further on, further on. 
And if it seems long and tedious, well, remember, samsara is longer and more tedious. At least you've got a sense of direction. Most people don't have any direction at all. They just fly around like bugs, up, down, in and out, not go knowing where they're going. But at least you're on a path, and it's a path that goes someplace. And although there may be suffering involved in the path, there may be stress still, it's a lot easier than not being on this path. And the various skills you develop, the tools you have, you learn that you can use to fend off whatever suffering you encounter. It's just like playing chess. Again, it's not that all the pleasure comes in winning at the end. There's a pleasure that comes in learning to be a strategist, learning to figure out your next move. So learn to enjoy the game. Even if you don't get checkmate today, there's always tomorrow. see that as an opportunity rather than a burden.